you, Ray Wenrick. I'm the CEO of the lab and, and Lab Ventures. I see a lot of new faces. How many people this is the first time in the lab? Excellent. Like maybe 20% of you. We're glad to, we're glad to have you here. Um, at Lab Ventures, our, our whole mission is to connect the startup community with large corporations and vice versa for everyone's benefit. And so the topic of tonight's discussion and panel is, is very apropos and near, and near to our hearts, which is the whole trend now in corporate venture capital. And Andrew will talk a lot more about that. But 40% um, of the Fortune 500 now have a formal venture capital fund, and one in five deals um, in venture have the participation of a corporate venture capital fund. So this is a very big and uh, an important trend in venture. And I don't think it's going to go anywhere, go away anytime soon, although Andrew's got a lot of great stories about why it's not always uh, such a successful strategy. But I think we can have a very engaging conversation. We also have a couple of uh, fantastic startups uh, from the local community that are that have received money from corporates. So you can talk about it from uh, the perspective of what's it like to work with a, a corporate venture fund or directly a corporation. So we're um, really excited to have Alex and Will uh, joining us tonight as well. Thanks, guys. Um, before we get started, I'd like to introduce Peter Pruitt, who is the Managing Director for South Florida for Deloitte and our sponsor for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I know you're not here to see me, so <laughs> I, won't, I won't take a lot of time. But sir, I just wanted to say on behalf of Deloitte, uh, welcome you to this. It's uh, as T. Gray kind of alluded to, this is a great event because it kind of, for us, even marries uh, you know, our passion for the startup community and helping the startup community and, and, and working with those future corporations, but also with our corporate, our larger corporate base and this kind of emerging trend of corporate venture capital. So it's great, great for us to be here. We're very excited about it. We're looking forward to hearing from Andrew. And with that, I'll turn it over to and thank you, Peter, and thank you uh, to all Deloitte for uh, your generous sponsorship, making this possible, and, and bringing Andrew uh, to join us tonight. So, Andrew Romans is the author of the new book, Masters of Corporate Venture Capital. Um, we've been handing them out. I think there's still a couple of copies left if you didn't get one. Um, but he is a venture capitalist, former entrepreneur, and a general partner at Rubicon Ventures, and has uh, done a ton of research into this topic of corporate venture. And, uh, so if you haven't read the book, uh, there'll be some surprises probably tonight, but I encourage you to do so. Very interesting and it's in a very, very powerful trend. So I flew in uh, this morning on the, on the red eye. We're uh, very, very grateful that you did that and uh, excited to hear from tonight. So with that, everyone please welcome Andrew. Thank you. So is, my mic, is my mic working? My mic, the mic is working, great. Yeah. Okay, well first, let me thank Marco and Tigre for bringing me down here and Pam for making this a great event and Deloitte, of course. We've been talking about doing an event in Miami for years on any topic, so we finally found a topic to do. Um, by the way, how do I advance the slides? Oh, there's a clicker. Okay, great, so my name is Andrew Romans. I'm a general partner at Rubicon. So actually, that's only for the videos. Okay, Not oh, I see. Use both. Okay, much better with the mic. So. <laughs> My name is Andrew Romans. I'm a general partner of Rubicon Venture Capital, um, which I co-founded with Joshua Siegel. Josh, where are you? So, so Joshua runs our New York office. He's our other general partner, and I'm San Francisco. That's why we have the two cities kind of you know, blending together there. But I'm going to talk a little bit about corporate venture capital. I think it is an important topic, um, especially if you're an entrepreneur outside of New York or outside of Silicon Valley, where there's just so many more angels, early stage, late stage, growth stage funders, you know, and that's what, I mean, we're going to get into that in the panel with, you know, real live entrepreneurs who've successfully raised money here. And so I think that'll be interesting of like, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy anywhere. Um, the fact that corporates are jumping in and out of the startup world is something that we can all take advantage of. And the corporates have a lot to access with the startup innovation. So we'll talk about it from a little bit of on what's in it for the corporate, like why should they do it, and how should they stop screwing it up. They're not doing it very well, most of them. And then what's in it for the entrepreneurs, you know, to get a partnership with a huge corporation that you can grow quickly with is different than just what Josh and I and our 17 venture partners can do for you. 
And then there's what's in it for blood-sucking venture capitalists like us that just want to make money, and just want to make a real financial return. But before I jump into stuff, I just want to get a sense of who's here so I can kind of guide you know, how much time I spend on whatever topic. Raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur. Okay, so that seems like most of the people. How about if you're an angel investor? Okay, how about a corporation? How about an active CVC, an active corporate venture capitalist? Okay, so we're gonna pick on that guy. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna beat we're him up. All right, so, yeah, so I guess I already talked about this. So I wrote this first book. Um, a lot of founders that I was giving advice to said, this is a pretty funny story, why don't you, you know, wrap it up in a book? And I ended up getting about 50 VCs and entrepreneurs to tell their stories, and we put it into this first book, and it went out in a bunch of languages, and it's getting me traveling everywhere, so it's actually been good for us to raise money for the fund, you know, from all these different places. So this is the new book. So I actually was an entrepreneur, as Tigray said. I founded a company that was in Tyson's Corner, in DC and I ended up raising money from Lucent. So it was, a, it was a bit of a telecom thing and they put in 25 million, they put in another two or three million and then we raised almost 50 million from independent financial VCs. So I had the experience of raising money from these people while also raising money from the regular VCs, the independent financial VCs, and then um, to live with them as well. Um, so it's kind of an interesting experience. Then, a large corporation in China asked me to advise them on forming their CVC. It was another telecom related company. And I said, okay, I'll, I'm happy to do that. I'd like you to invest in our fund, but what I'll do is I'll interview the top 20 CVCs. And again, CVC is corporate venture capital. That means like Microsoft Ventures, Intel Capital, right? You know, SAP Ventures. So I said, I'll interview the top 20, I know them, and I'll ask them how they do everything, how they're set up, do they have an investment committee? Does the CFO have to sign off? Do you need a head of a business unit to agree before you write a check? Is it on the balance sheet, off the balance sheet, all this stuff? And then I'll show you like 20 case studies of how they do it. And then I'll make my recommendations for you. I think every corporation is different. And we'll talk about that too, that they shouldn't all try to do the same thing. So I then thought I'll also write a second book. I'd written the first book, why not write a second book on this topic? And I then decided to keep going after the 20. Um, for me, you know, a lot of what Joshua and I do is we meet with other VCs, we meet with Marco and Tigre, and we look at the startups that they have, and we try to pick the best ones to invest in. And all these meetings with the CVCs resulted in them showing me their deal flow and me showing my deal flow to them. And often, they're not only investing, they're the ones buying companies. So I thought, this is not a total waste of my time. Even if this is a very niche book, I don't think I'm gonna retire on my royalties from you know this book but like there's probably only a thousand people that care in some ways but I was doing my job by meeting a hundred of them and asking them so I let it go for another year and so I thought I knew everything about corporate venture capital from having raised it and been in so many meetings with them for so many of my startups but I did learn a lot and I tried to put some of that in the book and it's got a bunch of case studies there's a new book I'm working on called Masters of, and, and by the way, the funny thing is McGraw-Hill changed the title of my first book to the Entrepreneurial Bible of Venture Capital, which I can hardly spell or pronounce, and I hated that title. And when they translated it into Chinese, they called it Masters of Venture Capital. And I was like, yeah, that's much cooler. So, so uh, I called the first, the second book is Masters of Corporate Venture Capital, the new one's just Masters of Raising Angel and Venture Capital. So that one I'm working on, it'll come out sometime this year. Um, so the big picture is what's in it for the corporate, what's in it for the startup, what's in it for the, you know, people trying to make a financial return and make money. I think I'll get into it more deeply, but you know, it used to be in ancient times of the 80s and the 90s, you needed a huge budget like uh, Hewlett Packard or IBM TJ Watts to create innovation, running stuff on a Cray computer or something. And then you know, the cost of startups and Amazon and open source and offshore and just everything in social networks made launching a startup super cheap. So it used to be that 5% of all the patents were outside of the large corporates. Now it's at 30% and it's probably moving faster and faster and faster. If you graduate from Harvard or Stanford or you know, Florida or whatever, you probably don't want to 
join a large corporate or work for the government anymore. That might still be the case in Japan, but it's really not the case now. People want to be Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. And so how does the corporate access that human capital? How does the corporate access basically innovation? I'll go deeper on that later. You know, what's in it for the startup? You know, imagine that you take money from say Telefonica and you've got a mobile app and they're number one, two or three mobile network operator in 23 countries. And imagine you get that, that mobile app blowing up on, you know, across the world. Within a year, you've got enough revenue to actually IPO as a profitable high growth company. Like if you can harness your startup to a corporate, it could be amazing. But the truth is it's pretty hard to get stuff done with these guys. And we'll, we'll talk about that too. So there's something in it for the startup if you can get it. The other thing as Tigre said, it's true. 20% of all venture financings in the United States are done with a CDC. And if you don't live in Silicon Valley or New York or a major, major tech corridor where there's a ton of VCs and angels, this might be, you know, definitely worth going through some pain to talk to them, you know, just to get your damn money to get, so you can build your company. And then for us financial guys is, you know, I'll talk more about our role in the marketplace later, but you know, the spoiler alert is we're raising money from corporates ourselves so that we can insulate the startup from that pain and we can meet with the startup, talk to the corporate and say, would you put that app on all the mobile phones that Telefonica has? And then if they say yes, then we invest and kind of make things happen. So we're adding more value. I mean, when I was an entrepreneur, I, got, I came to the one point where I said, you know what a good VC is? A good VC is a VC that doesn't destroy value. Just give me the money and stay away. You know, like they were on too many boards. They were not present. They weren't prepared before the meeting or present at the meeting or doing their stuff after the board meeting. And um, so to me, the best VC is one that adds value. If you're seen to be, you got cash and you're adding value, the deal flow will find you. And if you're getting the, a lot of deal flow and you get into those good companies and you add value, you'll make fine money more than you need and it'll be good. So why should, why should a corporate bother having one? There's not a ton of corporates here, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but as an entrepreneur, it's worth understanding what their drivers are, why they're doing it. If you've got $100 billion of revenue or more, or $35 billion of revenue, does it make sense to be deploying even 50 or $100 million a year? It probably will not have an impact on your earnings per share, your market capitalization, or, or you know, your top line growth, or your bottom line EBITDA. And you know, most corporates trying to deploy a lot of money would probably even destroy value. They'd probably screw it up and be losing money. So why are they doing it? I think that it depends who you are. If you're Time Magazine and you own 70 print publications, you're going to go bankrupt. It's just a matter of time. You're going to hell in a fast car. You got to do something to change up your business and get onto mobile, understand new revenue streams for your business. You know, for a lot of companies that I talk to, when they ask for advice, I say, let's look at, you know, for a huge corporate or a conglomerate, let's look at your revenue by category and when did you start that business? And it's often like 30 years ago, 20 years ago. And these, these things are changing. So they need to diversify their products and services, grow revenues, and if nothing else, juice M&A. So you've got one company that's like going bankrupt quickly and they've got to do something. And using corporate venture capital as a weapon to get into innovation and bring that external innovation internally into the company is critical and CBC can be used to juice and drive M&A. And then there's other companies out there that we meet with that are making so many billions of new dollars every year, they don't know what to do with it. They're literally saying like, you know, should we pay a dividend with this money? Or we don't really want to do that. Should we, you know, vertically integrate, horizontally integrate? If they start putting money into corporate venture capital, they start to see what the startups are working on. And it can even drive what HR should be doing. What kind of people should we be hiring? Should we be hiring voice recognition people and allow our customers to talk to our products? You know, should we be using high, hiring big data people, artificial intelligence people, just to see what's going on in the startup world? You know, can can help do that. But at a minimum, at a minimum, use CBC to drive your M&A program. You know, you know, there's obviously you know a, getting a steady flow pipeline of access to licensing deals, partnering with startups, and ultimately buying them. The investing part isn't really all that important to what's happening. The most important thing is to get 
reoccurring revenue streams that are in the billions of dollars to continue to get growth and there's offense and defense. So it, it's pretty easy to say that it would be almost crazy for a large corporation to not have some level of participation in the venture capital world. But we'll talk a little bit about how they, uh, they make it hard for themselves to, to do well. I mean, so the, you know, the obvious thing would be, um, you know, if you're, if you're having trouble getting money from the financial VCs, this is another you know, set of people to go to. When you're raising money, it's good to make a target list of investors that you think are a fit for your stage and your sector and your geography and run a process. And if there are not a ton of VCs that are hip and active in your area, but you're working on some topic that they like, that um, you, know, you might have a better chance of scoring money from uh, the CDC than you would for a VC that says we only invest in Silicon Valley companies. But I mean, I think the big thing, you know, the number one cause of death for a startup is running out of cash. And you, know, you either get it from customers, you get it from investors. If you're getting it from the government, you should probably change your job. But, but the, you know, there's nothing better than revenue. There's nothing better than profitability until all these investors to go, go away. So if you, can, if you can get a partnership with a large corporation to help you drive sales, that's a big deal. The, and, and often I tell entrepreneurs, if you hear all negative things about CBCs that they're just bad, 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 I say still take the meeting with them because and, and see if they can get a business unit interested in what you're doing. And that's better than raising money from us and spending it on salespeople and failing to get the sales agreement. So usually the CBC, in theory, is directly connected to like the CEO and the CFO. And we'll talk about that uh, with the entrepreneurs about you know, what they were able to achieve with them and what they were able to achieve with their purely financially driven, you know, VCs. But I think that ultimately you want to, you know, grow your business and get into revenue and minimize time wa wasting of time. It's pretty easy to waste time at a large company when you're a little startup. Sometimes the, you know, they tell you what month they're going to do something and you forgot to say what year. You know, they can be, you know, there's, there's startup speed and then there's like corporate speed. It can be very slow. One of the frustrations of even working at a CDC yourself has got to be you want to move fast and you're trying to get the damn business unit to do something or get approval for all that. So are they all bad? I mean, you should, if you look on Google, Fred Wilson, CDC, he's got this amazing video where he completely loses it. It's like a, his Donald Trump moment of like, never, ever, ever, ever work with any of them. And he's basically saying that if you let a CDC invest in your startup round, that it's really M&A hunting, and they don't care about you selling at a high price. Believe me, Joshua and I, we're basically trying to buy low and sell high and be popular to get invited into the next deal. So we really want, if we invested in your companies, guys, we want to just get the biggest exit we can possibly get, you know, and we're willing to do it, what's right for your families, so that we can work with you on your next one. The CVC doesn't really care about this at all. They just want to either buy you or, God help you, buy your competitor. So if the CVC wants to be on your board of directors, you know, put it this way, this is like the Fred Wilson story is that startup raises money from an independent VC and the CVC, and then the CVC becomes a customer. So now they got revenue going from there. The other VC is saying, this is exciting. Um, let's run a process and raise money at a much higher valuation. This is going in the right direction. And then the CVC, somebody at you know, corporate M&A says, if we don't buy this, Cisco could buy this and push us out of the data center or whatever it is that they're trying to get into. They're trying to diversify into something else. And now they're thinking, we want to buy this company, we want to buy it now. So do they want to buy it for a low price or a high price? They want to buy it for a low price, as low as possible. And so here I'm on the board maybe with the CBC saying, no, 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 no. Let's raise a $20 million round on a pre at 60 and then make, make you pay 4x the post minimum. They're saying, I don't think we should. In fact, let's stall the revenue. Let's, so they can even stall the revenue and make it impossible for me and the CEO to go and raise money. You know, so I mean, these are, these are, the, these are the war stories. Now, the truth is things are much better now than they were in the dark ages. And a lot of the CDCs have figured out that if they do that uh, every single time, that they won't even get meetings and they'll fail to achieve their objectives. In chapter one of the book, I basically asked every one of those hundred meetings, why do you do it? 
it's not to really make a financial return probably. The only reason the CBC wants to make a financial return is just to be a profit center so that they, they don't cut the whole CBC program. So that's their main, they just want to keep the organism alive so that their job continues. They, the real thing they're looking for is strategic you know, uh, value to the corporate. So, so I, I say um, if you do have to give a board seat to the CBC, then we have two sets of board meetings, one where the guy's there and one where they're not there. So at the, at the end of the day, this is, this is why uh, the, the, the bad CBC model, there's a bad one and a good model. The negative model is that the average CBC program gets launched with some big tech crunch disrupt party and then like two or three years later, it's completely over. They've canceled the program. So those people that were working at the CBC no longer work there because it doesn't exist anymore. They stopped investing. The other thing that tends to happen is that the individual that works at the CBC is given a list of topics they can invest in. A classic mistake the corporate makes is say, let's invest in startups that sell the same products and services that our company does, which I think is a big mistake. I think that your internal R&D is completely shackled. Like they're in a box, they can't think out of the box, they're in cubicles. And you don't want your external innovation program, your CBC, to be badly shackled. I say, let it run free and invest in transformational companies. And out of every 10 companies or 20 companies, there'll be one that's a blowout fit with the corporate. That's my model. That's not what they mostly do. They mostly say, you know, we sell this, invest in companies that sell very similar things, or we strategically want to just get into this next adjacent area. Let's use this to get into that. The, so if you're the individual that works at the CBC, you find this great, amazing artificial intelligence customer support thing, either of these two companies we're going to talk to in a minute, and unfortunately you can't invest in it because it's not on your shopping list of topics that you're supposed to focus on. Let's say that it is on your list of things and you want to do it, you, everybody want, it's, it's right in the, uh, your wheelhouse in your bullseye. You go to make the investment and you need sometimes to get the signature of the CFO of the company who might be off in India buying a, a power plant for $2 billion. So it often becomes difficult for them to actually physically, technically complete the investment and wire the money. It's a large corporation. They don't all get this down in the first few years of running it before it even gets canceled. So it's a little frustrating that uh, that's happening. And then the other frustrating thing is that a typical VC has a 2% annual management fee of the entire fund and 20% carry. So what that means is if, if you and I raise a $100 million fund at the, and there's just us, at the beginning of the year, we draw down $2 million, 2% of the $100 million. And the same thing happens next year and the next year and the next year. So we can pay people and accountants and Deloitte and run a good ship, right? The, then we invest the whole fund and after we've returned $100 million back to our investors, whoever put the money into our fund, there's an 80-20 split. We keep 20% of the profit for just us and that's carried interest. So if we're investing with the CVC into a deal and Google buys it for $850 million and we're going down to Brazil to buy some yachts because we're killing it, the CBC, his, his actual compensation might be tied to the performance of his conglomerate or the corporation. So that's frustrating after a couple years to see that. So not only did the CBC program get canceled after two and a half, four and a half years, the best people that work there get off that plantation and become free and do something else. They either get onto a two and 20, they try and move the fund off the balance sheet so they get two and 20, but with a sole limited partner investor as the corporation, which is good, or they end up um, at another CVC with a higher package or maybe better opportunity of um, stock options. So that means as a startup, it's very likely you're gonna be orphaned by your CVC investor. And so you should prepare for that. It may, maybe you don't get orphaned, but if you, if normal startup that's really kicking ass will raise money every nine to 12 months. We like to see a startup raise enough money to give them an 18 to 24 month runway. Doesn't always happen. But even if things are going well, investors want to invest in your company and you're gonna raise you know, money every, every two, two years or so or less. If your existing corporate doesn't exist anymore, well, forget them, that's a bummer. So the inside investors are not ready to contribute anything to the next round. It's a little bit of a problem. It's not the end of the world, but it sucks. And the other thing is that your guy or your woman is no longer at the corporate. She got off and she's now getting paid two and 20 
or she's got a better deal at another CDC, or she got sick of it. So now the new person might not be hip about your big data deal, and she's more into AI or some other little shiny object. So you could be orphaned there. So I tell people, take the meetings of the CBCs, try to get the business unit to work with you, be prepared to turn them down if you want to and you have other options. But if you take their money, try to uh, make the effort to get introduced to as many people inside the corporate as you can, the heads of business units. So long after they cancel the program, you've got someone in a position of power that can continue to give you attention and they might even pass the hat and invest off the balance sheet in that next round. So don't rely only on the CDC. That unit often is quite isolated from the business units and the business units don't love risk. They just want to buy from big blue IBM or Hewlett Packard, not mess with a startup that's got bugs and problems. So I think that when you are raising from a corporate, just ask lots of questions like, um, you know, what is the investment? Do you have an investment committee? Do I have to convince you or are there other people that need to be convinced? Do I have to basically do an enterprise sale of my software in order to get you to wire the money? Or even after everything's done and dusted, do you need another two months to wire money? You know, because that could collapse my syndicate. So just ask lots of questions. Ask questions like, are you the head of M&A and the CDC? Oftentimes it's both. At Cisco, Priceline, Qualcomm, the same individual. Frederick Rombo, who's in the book, he was the head of M&A for Cisco Europe, and he was the head of investments, their CBC. It's the same guy. So if you're thinking you want to sell your company to Cisco, um, but you just want to capitalize your company and get people to support you and help you grow, is now the right time to be talking to the head of M&A and showing them everything that you're doing while they're big and strong and you're still feeling a little weak. So that's something to consider. I say ask them and ask them about conflicts of interest and how they handle them. Google Ventures, GV, really does behave like a financial VC. They will tell you that GV, Google Ventures, has a Chinese wall between them and Corp Dev. I'm not sure I believe it, but that's what they say. Um, I think that probably is the right positioning. I think that you can be a workaholic as head of M&A, and you can be a workaholic as head of CBC. Why not have two people doing it and try to, at least to the public, say there's a Chinese wall between the two and don't make us you know, be super worried and think you're like Fred Wilson, that you're you know, really, really bad. Yeah, and also, this is a good question for any VC. Just um, say, do you mind introducing me to two or three other CEOs that you've invested in just so I can get a sense of their experience? You know? And then ask them what it was like. And that might be an extremely valuable meeting. Like, you guys could tell another CEO how to be successful getting support from the business unit or who's got the mojo power, who doesn't, and stuff like that. I think I've covered a lot of this stuff and I can put this on slide share. So advice to corporates is that, that I think that this, the, best, the best thing that they can do is if they want to access an innovation, all the reasons listed in chapter one of all the many reasons of why it makes sense to have a corporate venturing program is make a long-term commitment, make a 10 year commitment, set up an, a legal entity that's off the balance sheet and commit to putting in 10 million, 50 million or hundred million, whatever number makes sense that you can get approval for and put the money into that every year for 10 straight years. And after two, three, or four years, it should start paying back. By year seven, it should be profitable and evergreen, and then it shouldn't get canceled. You should give the people that make the investment decisions authority to make investments without getting a business unit involved, without getting the CFO or head of strategy or some C-level person involved. And they should be able to be, they should be compensated in some way with some kind of synthetic carry that if there's a big exit, they get paid. You, I could really feel the difference myself of my financial VCs were like, if things were bad, they were like, what, it's bad? I'm gonna kill you, this is gonna have to work. I can't lose money, I have to make money. Where the, the corporate guys were like, whatever, I'm busy. You, know, you, you, you could tell the difference. So I think that you gotta give real financial compensation and then that might keep your team together and they can get into a real flow and into the zone and just scoring goals. Um, so what are the options for a corporate to get in? There's like option one is invest into other funds. So you know, if the lab is setting up a fund, invest in their fund. They've got access to all the deals. They, know, they have relationships with everybody. If a corporate guy tries to develop relationships overnight with startups, you know, he's starting from ground zero. If they made their, their own personal list of what their goals are, it's gonna take a long time to achieve that. So I think do what Frederick Rombo from Cisco did very effectively. 
Cisco uh, had almost uh, half their sales was coming from Europe and they had no footprint other than salespeople in Europe. So they sent Frederick over, he invested in 47 VC funds, got access to all of their portfolio companies and could go through their portfolio companies and cherry pick which ones could do something with Cisco. And then he would ask the, the, the VC that he invested in, hey, insist that he take my money, like make him take my money. And then, and then the CEO says, well, I don't want to piss off my main VC here. I'll take money from Cisco. And then Cisco starts helping you. And, and so this way, Cisco is financially killing it as a venture capital group. As it's a real profit center there, CVC, because they cherry pick the best deals out of these 47 funds. Makes total sense. And these VCs already have legacy existing portfolios of companies. So overnight, they're right in the disco getting introduced to everybody they want to be as opposed to like queuing up outside where people have this negative view of a CVC that they're slow, they can't lead, you know, and, and all these other conflicts of interests. So I think that that's the smartest thing to do. If the other thing they can do is say, no, 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 I want to see my name in big bright lights and invest directly and not do the fund of funds. If they do that, I recommend that they don't call themselves by the same name of their company. Like Verizon Wireless Ventures, is a stupid name for a venture capital group. Because this, if, if I'm a startup CEO or the VC supporting my uh, startup and we take funding from Verizon Wireless Ventures, guess what? We can't even do any, we can't sell anymore to T-Mobile. We can't sell to AT&T Wireless or Sprint. It's over. We chose a side in like a conflict. Those guys are basically at war. We shut the door to selling our company to these other guys. I remember um, the minute, I mean, I was very young and dumb. I took money from Lucent thinking like they invented the telephone. This is a good thing. The minute I did that, Cisco stopped talking to us and said, we'll never talk to you again. We're never going to buy you. I'd rather eat my own leg than let, you know, Rich McGinn get money from, from, you know, John Chambers at Cisco. So it was over. It was like an emotional thing. So you're limiting your options if you take money from them. So if the corporate, if Verizon wants to increase their ARPU and lower their ACPU and lower their churn and diversify into other, like start giving mortgages over the phone as opposed to just being paid a little monthly thing. If they want to achieve that goal, they should stop calling themselves Verizon you know, Wireless Ventures, in my opinion. You want to see your name in big lights? Pay for it in Times Square. This is about achieving those goals. You know? And if you do set it up, I think that you need a balance of people that have been with the corporate for a long time and people that are external. The problem is most external people, unless you're going to offer them real compensation of two and 20, it's going to be tough to get the good ones. So, so I think the best thing is fund of funds first and almost overnight you achieve your objectives. And then step two is start cherry picking and invest directly when your corporation can do something with them. All right, so nobody here is really establishing a CVC. So I'm just going to blast through that. So a little bit of our role in the marketplace. So like I said before, I think a good VC is one that adds value. And you know, if, if everybody in Israel knows everybody else in Israel, then you know, adding one more Israeli to the, to the syndicate for the Israeli startup isn't really adding anything new or fresh. And so we've been traveling like all over the world, Singapore, Indonesia, Brazil, all over Europe and Japan and all these places meeting with large corporations, telling them that we can help them access startups here. And so if we invest in a startup here, we can get you partnerships with large conglomerates out of Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brazil, and all these kind of places. So we want to be adding value and we want to protect our startups from the pain of trying to get stuff done with a big corporation. Huawei, for example, they had $56 billion in revenue in 2015. And so they took 10% of that, 5.6 billion was their budget for R&D for 2016. With the help of the China Development Bank and other kind of unfair things, they're getting to 100 billion in revenue. And so their budget for people in cubicles is hitting 10 billion a year. They should totally chop off a chunk of that and not send PRC Chinese people to the Valley trying to get into deals as Huawei Ventures. Like Josh and I, when we raise money for one of our startups, so we invest, we're gonna invest in the next round and probably the next round, but we wanna bring in other syndicate VCs that can help. 
we make a Google Doc with, this is our first choice. It's like getting into college. I want to get into Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, Dartmouth, or something like that. And then my second choice is I want to go to, I don't know, this next set of schools, and my final one is like Alabama State Junior College, right? The, we don't even, you know, we don't even want to see Huawei Ventures on the third one, you know? They have three CEOs. One of them is a general in the Red Army. It's crazy. <laughs> so, so, so our view is raise money from a mix of angel investors, family offices, conglomerates, corporates, and we need, you know, you're not much of a venture capitalist without any capital, so we'll take money from institutional LPs as well. But the, you know, in the normal state of venture capital is you've got a layer up here. These are the LPs, the limited partners, pension funds, endowments, you know, family offices. They put the money into the VC fund. I call it the GP layer, the general partner. It's like me and Josh. And then we invest the money into a portfolio of companies, the startups down here. Maybe we should put the startups up here, but just for the sake of it, right? So normally there's no interaction between the LP layer and the startups down here. The LPs are just like, show me the baby, show me a return, and I'll invest in your next fund. I'm trying to deal with a $70 billion pool of money. This is very small to me. They might even hire someone else to manage it. Whereas in our model, we've got a bunch of individual people that each have their own business network. Like the guy grew up in Sao Paulo and he's behaved himself well. He's got a lot of friends, you know, and he's doing quite well and he owns a hotel chain and a bunch of other things. If we can, you know, find a startup and then talk to them about it, we let him do it. So we came up, or I'll just say this quickly. So the quick lowdown on Rubicon is that we have offices in New York and Silicon Valley. We can invest anywhere in the world, including Florida. There's nothing, we don't have any government money telling us to only invest in some strange place. Um, but geographically, most of our startups have been in the Valley and New York. But again, that's just because that's where we are. We would be very happy to invest in a company here. We tend to say we'd like to see the startup raise at least $1 million of non-founder outside money before they email us or contact us. We, we generally try not to take those meetings uh, until they've raised at least a million. And we generally like to invest in what I call late stage seed. So it's not like pre-seed or demo day stage. It's probably like the round after demo day. And we're trying to get in before the series A. The VC funds got supersized in response to 01 and 08 economic downturns because the big pools of money figured out that's the best place to make money. Real estate was a disaster and stock market was bad. So they realized they were always making money on VC. So the funds got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So the average Series A is a $10 million financing round. So when we come in at late stage seed, that's really what Series A used to be back when I was raising money for myself. Um, we then get into about 25, 35 companies in a portfolio, and we try to get our network to help them as much as possible. And then we double down and put more money into the ones that are doing well. So we de-risk by being in a portfolio of 35, and we de-risk more by putting most of the money into the companies that are purely taken off like rockets, and we're really hitting the Series A, which is like what a Series C used to be or a Series B used to be. You know, um, uh, as far as topics and like, you know, uh, what sectors we invest in, we're fairly open-minded, but we tend to invest in companies with very strong transformational technology that already have some revenue and we can see, you know, positive unit economics that it can get to profitability fast. And if we don't have something very specific to add value, almost like a CBC, we will, we will not invest. So I won't just throw money at something saying they can build a good business without any of our help. We want our reputation to be like, we invested, we introduced him to somebody in Brazil or in Florida or something, and then uh, you know, people love us. And we, we take a view of um, highly syndicated. So we, we typically invest in deals that already have someone like you know, Marco or Tigre that we know really well, and we have a lot of respect for him, we've gotten to know over many years, or a fund that's just got a, you know, a very strong track record, and we make sure we're in their good deals and not their bad deals. So we're very much share syndicated mentality of, of how we do this. You know, so you know, in closing, the you know our model is to be kind of like a multi CBC, raise money from corporates, help the corporates achieve all those objectives, work closely with their corporate development teams, work closely with their direct CBC investors, and get them into good deals where we think it's not going to limit the options of our company. Sometimes we can even have a corporate invest through our co-investment platform and so we can keep it a secret. So we 
we invest out of our fund into the startup and we do something different from most VCs. We have a co-investment platform. So if you invest in our fund, it's almost like an angel group with a fund in some ways. We um, show you the, you know, each deal where we're able to open up a side, we call it a sidecar fund. It's a special purpose vehicle. And any of the individual people can put small amounts of money. A corporate can put a big amount of money. You know, a family office can put a big amount of money. And we just put that all together and it goes to the startup. It's just Rubicon. So no one will ever know. So Cisco could buy your company and not know that Lucent, you know, was really putting the big bulk of money into that next financing round, which I think it's good. The other thing we do is we do our own private events um, where we get everybody together. So we do it a couple times here, like Josh has got a beautiful rooftop in New York and we've got an LP with an amazing backyard with these big redwood trees and we just invite everybody together so you get all the entrepreneurs, the founders, the angels, the corporates and you know, the family offices and conglomerates all just hanging out together talking. And then on a monthly basis, we're sending them the co-investment opportunities and saying, hey, our fund is putting more money into this company. You might have met them at the barbecue last year. They're killing it. You know, you should have invested at a $10 million valuation. We're now at a $250 million valuation. And we're funding companies that way. And we find that it populates the company with people that care, the people that can help. So unlike that passive LP layer, we've got this very active LP layer that really, um, they want to make money, but they also, you know, they like interaction. Yeah, I don't need to get into this. I mean, we, we rotate people from the corporate through our offices so they can see more of what's going on. So that's really it. We think that it makes sense. We think that it makes sense for corporates to do this, whether they want to, you know, do it on the balance sheet, pass the hat, make it hard to complete the round and not pay their team and the good ones will leave. Even if that happens, it's probably a good thing. And for locations in underdeveloped ecosystems, and by that I mean like outside of Silicon Valley, New York and London and Tel Aviv, I think that corporate venture capital is a good thing. We should all view this as a positive thing because you know, it, the, the ecosystem in Silicon Valley and New York and London has gotten to the point that you know, Oracle and Google and Facebook acquire so many companies that um, every time they buy a company, a bunch of people get rich and they're probably barely 30 years old. And then those people, now that they're rich and technical, they're gonna invest in the startups of the guys that used to work for them or other people that they're meeting. They'd rather do that than the stock market, which they probably barely understand. And unless you're breaking the law, no one's really making money in the stock market. So, and I'll just say one other point on that. I mean, you know, Gordon Gecko in the movie Wall Street, you know, greed is good. He goes to prison because he's trading on insider trading information and it's illegal, but that's because these were publicly traded liquid equities. In venture capital, if we introduce somebody to Telefonica and we know that they're going to blow it out and the revenues are going to just double this month and then they're going to go up and then it's going to go into all the best buy stores and we know just revenues going up and we know deeply this stuff is profitable as opposed to some analysts at Goldman Sachs trying to figure out what's the build of materials of this thing. You know, we really know. So we can trade on insider trading information directly that we know and it's not illegal. We look like heroes. You're supposed to be adding value, right? And you're supposed to be doubling down. So anyway, I'll close on that one. Never go to prison. <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're, we're doing an event tomorrow, which is really designed for, the, for people who really want to take a deep dive on knowing how to set up a CVC, best practices, key mistakes to avoid. And uh, we'll spend like a couple hours really getting deep into that. And we've been doing it all over the place and our intention is to you know, grow our own network so that we can add value you know, to the startup. And we hope to pick up a little money from some angels, families and corporates and conglomerates along the way you know, and build our track record. So, so with that, you know, I guess, um, should we, should you guys ready to do the panel? Yeah. Come on up. And, and then um, I, think, I think after we get into this, I mean, these guys, you know, know more than I do about what it's, I mean, for sure, of what it's like to be in Florida and raise money and get your company out and even an exit story. So I think it's better to wait through the questions when we're all up here, you know. So I'll ask a few questions and uh, you guys can start thinking of stuff you want to talk about. I mean, I'm personally obsessed with raising money because, I mean, 
you can you need it it's the blood and uh, if you want to you know grow really fast and if you it's like marrying the wrong person you know you can make a real mistake of getting in with the wrong person it's just life is too short for that so why don't you guys introduce yourselves first and then um, we'll dive into some questions uh, my name is Alexander Lundtong, I'm the CEO of a company called Feather, we're actually based in Gainesville, Florida, a few hundred miles north. Uh, the company is about five and a half years old, but we started when we were idiots in college. Uh, so we've been through two fairly substantial pivots, and uh, the last one is a pretty okay company. Uh, in the last two years in Gainesville, we've gone from two people to 30 people, raised about three and a half million bucks, one and a half or so of that from corporate venture capital. Um, that's basically where we're still kind of in the middle of the ride with institutional investors, corporate venture capital, and right in that kind of early stage of scale. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Will Weinrom. I'm the CEO of one of the co-founders of a company called Live Ninja. We're based here in Miami, literally two, uh, two blocks down the street here in Wynwood. Uh, started off as a consumer company based on a marketplace model, then we went through a couple pivots. We raised some angel rounds here in Miami. Uh, our latest round that we raised, uh, it was about a year and a half ago was when we finally took corporate venture capital. Um, and then kind of right after that round is when uh, we had some acquisition talks and we were recently acquired in December of last year. Okay, so I mean, we can, we can change it up and you guys feel free to drive the conversation too. Um, but I suggest we start talking first about just fundraising in general, like who cares whether, whether it was CBC or anybody as long as they're not Al-Qaeda or ISIS. <laughs> you know? And, then, um, and then, then I'd like to get a little bit more into the, you know, how, what's different about the CDC and how to be successful in getting some value out of that. And then uh, there's nothing better than an exit to guys like us. So we'll talk about the exit. And that's a complicated topic in itself. Yeah. So, so Alex, tell me, Alexander, tell me a little about, um, you know, did you find it challenging being in Florida? Or did you, you know, I, I think that we had even looked at your opportunity very early. So you managed to get on the radar, I guess, at New York Valley, DC. I mean, t tell me about, at the very beginning. Yeah, first I'd like to say when he was talking, he, he said that uh, Rubicon would be interested in companies. And the other thing I think it was like, well, Rubicon looked at Feather and Rubicon passed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he ruined the day sometime. Uh, <laughs> we have something called the Rubicon passed on live ninjas. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, That was uh, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Uh, there, I'll, I'll give two answers, which is uh, basically their exact opposite answer, which is in the early days, it felt like it was hard in Florida, uh, but it's actually because we had a really bad company and a really bad product. Uh, and then uh, basically the second experience that we had raising money was it was relatively easy. And I think that's my opinion now is it really doesn't matter where you are or where you are based. Yeah, I've said this a couple of times kind of vanically. America has found out that capitalism works and that entrepreneurism and, and things which generate value and profit have some gravity towards them for money. So if you actually focus on building a business model that provides value, generates money, money will literally find you. Um, so ultimately, I mean, our corporate venture capitals are like Dallas, London, our institutional investors are Naples, Miami. Uh, it was not especially hard to raise money once we actually focus on building a product. I mean, uh, from raising money, just my experiences here in Miami, we, we got started, we raised our first round in 2012. Uh, that's kind of right when the scene was just kind of starting to get going a little bit. Um, and uh, it was a little slow at first. We definitely were, were trying to raise money from uh, different parts of the country. And a lot of those places wanted us to relocate to New York or San Francisco to be closer to the fund. Uh, we, we didn't find a lot of trouble raising that first round of angel money here in Miami. And I think Miami has a really good base of early stage capital for angel investments and things like that. I think where we're starting to get better at, we're not quite there yet, is growth stage capital, Series A, Series B, and that, that kind of stuff. Um, but like Alex said, I mean, you're just seeing a shift now. A lot of funds are location agnostic. You know, they believe that good entrepreneurship is everywhere, regardless of location. Uh, certainly, people have come around to Miami, and there are a lot of VCs looking at Miami companies. So uh, things are getting better you know, every year. And, you know, I, I don't think it's uh, a, as much of a challenge raising capital here in Miami as it used to. Be. I don't think we use that as an excuse anymore. Who are the top? Who are the top three Series A VCs that are have have some of that list here? Tough to name off the top of my head. I mean, one that, that comes to mind very uh, as a, a fairly recent fund is Las Olas Ventures in Fort Lauderdale. 
Um, but as far as like really Series A people with a lot of capital to put money into startups, it's uh, it's tough to think of a few. You really got to go to New York and Austin. At this point, maybe uh, in Tampa. I don't Marco, know. do you know anybody? Arsenal, Arsenal, Arsenal. It's just in Central Florida, right? Yeah. yeah. Stonehenge. Stonehenge. Somebody mentioned. I don't know that. Okay. I mean, one of the advantages, I think, that a startup has when they're in a uh, non-Valley or non-New York area is that your development team might be more stable. You know, like if you're south of market in San Francisco and your CTO goes out for a falafel, you might, you know, he, he might walk down the street and there's like a board saying, not like soup of the day, but saying like Clyde Perkins just spent six million dollars. We can get dental to your dog. Come on in here. You know, so so it's tough to keep your team together. And every startup gets hit with a torpedo. And I'm sure you guys have weathered a lot of torpedoes, and uh, your team probably stays by you because this is the they've never worked at a cooler place than other companies. Whereas, like, that CTO in San Francisco is like, hey man, I just got a ball game from that guy, I'm not coming back. Yeah, no, that, I can say we benefited from that for sure. And also, I mean, there's a ripple effect with there's not as much competition, so, uh, you know, the, uh, the salaries are less, it gives you longer runway, lower burn rates, so, like, you know, million dollar round here in Miami, you know, can stretch about three times as long as the same round in San Francisco or New York. Yeah, and I, I think we, we had the exact same experience in Gainesville. I remember when we were drawing up our forecasts, we actually, we were at this inflection point where we were deciding where we were going to scale the company, where it was just eight and nine again, you know, after a pivot, and we had done some kind of early MVP testing. And we basically did two parallel forecasts, one what the company was like in New York, and one what the company was like in Gainesville. And it just becomes so uh, overwhelmingly advantageous. I mean, we looked at like all of the possible uh, negative cases of Gainesville, I and mean, it's travel expense, etc. It ends up being the cost of you know two different developers in New York versus Florida. Um, and he's right; it's really easy to be the coolest company in Miami or Fort Lauderdale or Gainesville, uh, whereas it's incredibly, incredibly difficult to do that in New York or San Francisco. So you find you're getting like a PR bump. You know, that's or, yeah, without a doubt. Hey, Joshua, don't these bartenders got got people in Gates in Gainesville. Yeah, yeah, we've got we've got some blood in there. Bartender was actually founded in Gainesville, and I think they started at the same uh, not three days start, but start weekend as we did in Tallahassee in 2012. Oh wow, talk to me about that. That's cool. All right, so um, what did, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs in the audience of how to identify? the angel investors to get started. I mean, like, we all know there's rich people in Florida, you know, what, you know but, but how do you find them? So, I, the, the early, early phase, uh, and, and before that, I think you have to decide, do I want to raise money, do I not want to raise money? I think most of the people in this room, and particularly Andrew, is in favor of raising money. Uh, I think, in, in general, I am too, Marco, uh, remember some of those conversations. But it's a decision that you have to make, and if you decide to raise money, you have to recognize that you are setting up a different set of milestones and KPIs for yourself than you are if you're just trying to build and scale a business. Those are not the same sets of activities. And if you're optimizing for raising money, then you have to look at the activity that I'm doing from a PR perspective, from a product development perspective, from a business development perspective, is optimized for making a good pitch a month from now, three months from now, six months from now. And so early phase for us was, Participate in every startup pitch competition that you possibly can. Every now and then there'll be some angels in the room. If you get better and better at that, you start to win those competitions, you start to attract some attention. And you basically probably go grow from their network, depending on how uh, experienced of angels there are. Have a good conversation with them. Hey, do you have any friends that do any angel investing? Do you know anybody else who would be interested in deals like this? And you kind of grow that way. Really, at least that's how we do it for our early angel investing. Yeah, I can echo those statements. I mean, like you said, you choose to raise money, you're now on the express train, you're no longer on the local anymore, and there's an expectation that you're gonna keep raising money at a higher valuation until some liquidity event happens. Um, but for us, and, and then as far as the question on how to find angels when you get started, I mean, being at events like this is great. Talking, I mean, the warm introduction is like currency, right, in our, in our scene. So you gotta find that warm introduction, I mean, happens kind of serendipitously, you tell everybody that will listen to you about your company, every single person that will give you five minutes, you talk about your company. No, don't, you know, don't waste your time on NDAs and playing yeah. exposed to the best. Like, talk to as many people as you can about your company, and then ask, do you know any investors? You know, I just like to get some feedback and some advice, and if they do know some people, they can set up a, a warm introduction, you know, like double opt-in intro or something like that. And, uh, 
and that's how you can kind of get started. And then you meet with one investor, and then you ask for another introduction. Again, that warm intro is like currency. I agree that I, I was telling everybody about my startup to the point that I would like blast a cab driver, you know, everything about my startup in San Francisco. And at one point, I was at a party, you know, with my Georgetown buddies, and uh, this guy pulls me and goes, "Dude, stop telling this girl about your signaling gateway and the asynchronous a transfer mode thing. She doesn't care." I'm like, really? Right. I changed the topic. Anybody who has a marketing background, you like, you know, you have email open rates and click through rates on ads, and you're used to seeing, you know, 0.01%. It's the exact same thing for investors. You, you get so so comfortable with being rejected, and not paying attention to. But like I said, serendipitously, every now and then somebody goes, oh, I have some experience. In that. I understand the industry. The things that you're saying are not uh, bothersome to me, but I, you know, I'm interested in having coffee with you. And it takes a lot of manual effort in the early early days. But if you, you know, optimize your business and actually are producing something that generates value, it starts to build eventually. Okay, so tell me about the corporates that invested in your, your I mean, how did you get to them? And like, remind us all the names of the corporates that invested. Uh, we raised from two corporates, so Citibank and Comcast. Uh, so ours, we had two also, uh, they're much less popular names because we uh, work in the super boring industry, re-exhibitions, and Freeman Blank, it should, there should be a second word. Uh, Reed Exhibitions is the largest trade show organized in the world. There's sort of $1.82 billion uh, annual revenue based in uh, London. And then Freeman is actually the largest kind of events company, full stop. They're based in Dallas, 4,000 employees, two plus billion something uh, revenue. And interestingly, something that was different for us about how we found them relative to your presentation is we came in on the commercial side first. So we, we got some introductions to show directors, marketing directors inside the company. Uh, it was super easy to look cool and fancy in our space because it's about 10 years behind the rest of the world. Uh, and so we went relatively quickly up the food chain also because we had people like Marco who would, at the appropriate time, you know, say good things about us to the right people. So it took us six months to go from marketing director, which was like six layers removed, all the way up to the C-suite in the global office. Great. So, so hearing you say that, it sounded like you were in a sales mode, and then and then your customer said, "Not only do I love this, but I want to own a piece." And then we're really partner. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Uh, tell, tell tell everybody a little bit about what your company does, sure. so we understand why trade shows are relevant. Sure. So Feather is it's marketing and data platform for people who organize live events. The basic uh, stuff is it's a purpose built kind of communication engagement platform for attendee acquisition, but then also selling digital sponsorships to exhibitors, sponsors, speakers, etc. at an event. The basic example is we allow event organizers to make digital money off of your identities. So hypothetically, if the lab were a customer, everybody who registered, everybody who went through Eventbrite, everybody who went to the website, if they used Feather, they would have you tag identify and say, hey, this is Andrew Roman, he was a speaker, he was uh, he you know, works for Rubicon, this is this particular person, they're an attendee. And then we offer to the exhibitor sponsors, not we, but we as the platform enabler are supposed to do this. They can then sell, hey, you want to run a Facebook campaign or you want to run an uh, email campaign or a retargeting campaign at these specific people. Great, you can do that through me and I'll try to do a 10x markup on the media that I'm buying. And that's one of the reasons that it went relatively quickly up the food chain is our products that they're selling, I actually literally just ran these numbers and had this conversation with Reed, uh, is 90, 93, 94% gross margins. And so when they look at that, they're like, oh, wow, this could be really, really uh, impactful for our business globally, and that's why it went so quickly. And you know, when I hear this, it sounds like you're selling to a customer, and they dig it, and now they want to invest. But um, how, do they know, how do they know how to price it? How do they know how to, uh, what's a one-time liquidation preference, or participating preferred, and all these other you know, little fun lawyer stuff? Yeah, so uh, I'm actually, I'm curious to hear uh, your experience with uh, Comcast and essentially people who have some experience with it because we got best and worst of both worlds in that they had no idea how to price it, which meant we could price it however we wanted. Uh, and the, the corporate guys said, that sounds fine. And so we got originally valuation preferences, participant preferred, everything that we wanted. And then what we did, I think still intelligently, I would say, is you leverage the fact that you have these corporate investors, commercial relationships with institutional people, and you play the right way. It's like, listen, I don't know if I need your money. I've got these corporate guys. They're from the same world. But maybe if you want to participate, you can. Uh, and then when the institutional person comes in and they're on their phone call, they say, hey, by the way, you should really ask for why to participate and prefer. And the corporate guy goes, 
okay, I'll do that. But we got to keep some of it, which wasn't a hugely inflated valuation relative to where we were early. So they gave on that and made us give up some other preferences. By the way, I think it's a big mistake for a startup to um, corner a couple of corporates and raise money at a higher valuation than the market would bear because you, no matter, every time you're raising money, you should expect that things may not go well, as you would hope, like that hockey stick in your Excel spreadsheet may not take off. And um, you gotta make sure that if I, if I get myself an 18 month runway with this financing, um, 12 months from now, I wanna get down and serious about circling wagons, making that list of who we're gonna go to and market our deal. And if you haven't made, if you haven't grown into that crazy inflated valuation, then it's gonna to be tough to raise money. And again, number one cause of death, running out of money. So it's important not to, entrepreneurs kind of are born coming out of their mom as screaming valuation and dilution. Like they understand that from in the womb. Whereas these other things, like, oh man, I gotta make sure that I don't raise it too high valuation, so I can either be flat or better up. You know, and it's, it's an important thing. It's one of the things that corporates do get wrong. Now, City and Comcast, they've been at this for forever, so you know, I assume you didn't have any issues with that. No, I mean, it was a relatively smooth process that they joined around. We already had a lead investor set. Um, Comcast was kind of serendipitous in how we met them. The, the, uh, you know, the, we got invested essentially through Comcast had a special vehicle, a special fund, a fund within a fund, essentially, for minority entrepreneurs, and they were looking at the Miami market to invest in minority entrepreneurs, so I was happy to be connected to him, and I tried to tell them and convince them that Jews were a minority, but he didn't really buy it. Uh, but, uh, you know, Emilio and Alfonso, both my co-founders, are Hispanic, so he wanted to meet with them, hear about their story, etc. and then, you know, that's, we got to talking, and they eventually joined in on the round. And uh, and City was kind of similar to, to your experience. They started off. We pitched their innovation team uh, here in Miami, right in downtown. Uh, Jorge Ruiz. And we pitched Jorge what we were doing. They got very excited. They said, "We got to introduce you to a few different units within City." So we were talking to three different departments very very quickly. And one of the divisions that got whipped was their you know venture arm. And all of a sudden, we had a meeting set up where they wanted to see a demo of the platform and. Apparently, what we were building was like right on what they were doing in their product roadmaps and some of the platforms that they were looking at. Um, so it immediately became very interesting to them, and you know we told them we had an active round going and we're you know approaching a close, and they immediately wanted to get involved in that. So did either of you have the experience that the CBC was able to lead the financing round or only able to follow and join a syndicate? So for us. Uh, one of the corporates was initially kind of set themselves out as the lead, and then because of the way negotiation went, we essentially had an institutional fund that would only participate if they could co-lead. Uh, and so, like I said, we got the best and worst of both worlds in that we got the uh, efficiency and uh, understanding of all the preferences and uh, voting rights, et cetera, that the institution was wanted with some of the expediency that went along with that. But then we also got give on some of the things because the corporate was kind of leading it, they still were the, first, they were the first person to commit, and so even the institutional uh, guy, the person who represented them, in some cases, you know, would do your, and say, technically you're the lead, so I'll, ultimately I'll leave this to you if you're okay with the valuation, I'm going to say okay. Um, but then there were some delays, like you said, because it, particularly for us, you know, both of our corporates were, we were the first or second check that they ever wrote, so they, they had to learn how to do this, so we had to wait for some stuff. Okay, so now you've got the cash finally. Um, let's talk about working with them and getting something beyond the cash. But, but uh, like I, expert, I figured out with Lucent that they had this like marketing budget, and they, we could get to that marketing budget. And I was able to even like pay for plane tickets and booths and all kinds of stuff. I was taking anything I could get, you know, from Lucent beyond what they wired. What, talk a little bit about your experience about um, good and bad, and what to do, what not to do for these entrepreneurs if they do take money from corporate. Sure, um, I can echo and reinforce what you said, that as quick as possible, you should get away from the M&A guy or CDC guy and get to business units, directors, etc. cetera. Uh, in, in our experience, it's not even so much as the conflict between CDC and M&A and the way they participate, it's that the M&A and CDC guys are basically impotent for the stuff that you actually care about, which is, hey, can you make this business unit actually buy something, actually do something, they, they can't. And so what you do is you ask for an intro, you leverage that relationship, 
go to the office. And so they, I, I did this a couple of times. Uh, they were based in London, so you know, Reed's uh, primary offices in London. I, I would go under the auspices of meeting with the CBC guy or the representative, and you just email some people that you have some kind of loose relationships with, you've been in a meeting, they've heard your presentation. You say, hey, I'm gonna be the office, I wanna to talk to you, or just you know, wanna see what's up, and you get in there, and I would say, now the, the CBC guy, the representative from the company, is less than 5% of the deal. With. So we try to diversify our commercial relationships as quickly as possible. Yeah, um, so as far as like experience post money, I mean, we, yeah, I had a very good experience working with corporate VCs, both Comcast and City. I mean, they were great. Um, and, you know, they, they didn't take board seats, but they were observers, you know, in board meetings. Um, and what I can say is, they were very, very active as far as introductions to the business units. They would always give the caveat and say that they don't have, you know, influence over those business units. Those business units are trusted to make the best decision for those particular divisions, that they can make the introductions. And obviously, we carry a little bit of weight being a portfolio company, but, it, you know, that was always given like a warning, like, that doesn't give you kind of like preferential treatment over anything else. So there's always that. Um, I can say that, again, they were very active whenever we asked for something, and whenever they set up an introduction, I mean, their introductions carried a lot of weight. Like, they would in, in, introduce us to CEOs at, like, you know, household name companies, and they would get, we get responses from emails, like, very, very quickly. Um, you know, whenever we asked for an introduction or for a connection into a particular market, they seemed to be right on top of it with connections, so they were extremely well-connected and always willing to make that intro, and those, those intros ended up being very fruitful. So. So, yeah, I said a lot of disparaging things about CDCs earlier, but, but the truth is I think City Ventures and Comcast is, is, is like the good ones. You know, like I think they're very good. Yeah, Luis who runs City is awesome, and my grandma's team is good. Comcast had a little bit of turnover, but David Horowitz stayed there for 10 years. Which is pretty impressive. They, did they really introduce you? I, mean, I think it, like if you raise money from City, you raise money from City, you just put that logo on your slides, and now you're gonna like knock down the dominoes of all the other banks. Like, if, you know, it's almost like a model. Like City could say, "I'll invest in your company, let you use my logo, and boom, it'll be like a bump." You know, I mean, they're gonna. We're gonna have to shout. Well, that's a bummer. I, I hate it. I hate it when I can't hear it, the guys up front. <laughs> but well, all right. One one question is um, a lot of times the idea of raising money from corporate and even from corporate is that there's going to be some kind of it's back on. We're back on. there's going to be there's going to be some kind of partnership. And if the company in, in the olden days, not only would they not leave, but they would come in around Series C when it's a bit later stage. And I, I, I guess I came to understand that um, if they try investing in a seed stage, accelerator stage company, there's no chance they're gonna get a business unit to wanna talk to that guy or talk to a company, you know, not a battle-hardened, market-tested product. So it almost makes sense that the CBCs are investing in slightly later stage stuff so that they have a shot at getting a business unit to work with you. What, what was your perspective? I mean, I also got a sense that the introductions to the business units were also insightful to our roadmap to help pave the way to what we were building. So they would be like, you have to talk to this particular unit. If you guys are working on AI, you really need to understand what they're looking for, you know, from a rec perspective. So that's what was like a lot of those meetings was like, so really interested in Lab Ninja, it checks a lot of the boxes, but let me tell you about what we're really trying to achieve with this particular project. And that was really insightful for us. Um, so was, was that, that aspect I think was always very helpful. I mean, like, you know, I discussed this in the book a little bit that um, sometimes a corporate has domain expertise, obviously, in something. And so, like, Yahoo invested in Yahoo Japan, and they saw how in Asia people do everything. So, like, PayPal mixed in with Amazon, mixed in with everything. And then, so they knew Alibaba was going to be big because they already, you know, had the Japan, you know, domain expertise. So it could be good for them. And it can be good for you. I think that that's, that's another you know kind of win of why I tolerate a little bit of pain to get to something good. So should we talk a little bit about the, your exit? Yeah, we can. Yeah, I mean every exit's a crazy, crazy ride, and, and and I guess you're not allowed to disclose too much, right? right. Yeah. What can you disclose? Uh, it's January, right? Just happened. It happened in December. Yeah, okay. we were acquired by IET, which is a publicly traded company. Um, 
they were super excited about it. Um, it was a good deal. You know, we were, you know, the, the parameters of how they set it up, it was uh, the right move for us at that particular time. So. And, and they were not investors, right? They just came out of nowhere and bought you. Right. Okay. And, you know, uh, I mean, anything you want to share and lessons learned? Was it like burnout or cash up front? Or? Yeah, there, there are some provisions in there um, that we have to work towards. I mean, we, obviously the team has to be retained and things like that. We've got to stay on for a little bit. I mean, there, there are things in there that we have to abide by. Um, but as far as tips on being acquired, I mean, I think, I think a lot of people and entrepreneurs, they make mistakes by talking to corp dev. You know what I mean? Like they go straight to corp dev, and I think that's really the wrong way to do it, or at least I, I've learned. Uh, you're really getting somebody to be the internal champion for why this deal makes sense. So it's either the CEO of the company, or the VP of sales, or the VP of product, if it's like tech trader or something like that. There's a technical reason, or a revenue reason, or, or high level strategy from the CEO. The corp dev guy is kind of there to make sure the deal gets done, sure they can bring suggestions and things like that. but. Um, what I've learned is that you kind of want to start kind of one of those three, build influence, and then go from there. And so actually, I have a couple of questions. Did either of your corporate investors have right of first refusal, veto rights, anything like that, any preferential with respect to the acquisition? No. Yeah, I mean, just fast on that topic. Some, some CVCs, the good CVCs don't ask for lots of strings attached because that just alienates a lot of deal flow and you know, inhibits them from achieving their objectives. But um, in the old days, and some of them still do, um, they get confused between um, doing business or buying a company and I'm investing. Like I think they're legitimately not even sure which one they're doing. And they, they, they want to write a first refusal to buy the company. So I mean, talk about limiting your options. You know, so never take, never give them a row for write a first refusal. If you have to, give them a write of first notice, which can even benefit you. Like Google, if, if Google says we want to buy you and they hear that one of your advisors is shopping the deal, that's it. They make an example of you. It's like Mexico, you know. <laughs> they don't want any anyone shopping it. If you say, "Hey, man, I've got this right right at first notice with Ericsson. I have to show it to them." That actually helps you auction a little bit, so you can use it to your advantage. But yeah, I think performance warrants and all that stuff. It depends. Another thing to be careful of with the corporate is that they can ask for so much crap. Like we want exclusive rights in Latin America, or this or that, or this or that. And it goes back and forth, and before you know it, your legal bill with DLA is like 70000 bucks a month, and that's killing your burn, and then you walk away from it at the end. You know, that's a danger point. So one of the pieces of advice that we were given, uh, and I think probably in retrospect it's amazing that we were actually able to execute on it, was we were told, keep the commercial relationship and the investment relationship completely, completely separate. And so eventually what I told uh, one of the folks who actually started asking for this stuff was the investment is completely standard, right? It has to be completely standard deal docs. It's your, you're in the same layer preferred that everybody else is in. Uh, but as a commercial uh, relationship, you're the biggest customer in the world. You can ask me whatever you want and I will probably say yes. And we had to kind of guide it in that way that all of the preferences that you want as a part of this investment, you just happen to be coincidentally asking for them as a, as a commercial relationship, not as the uh, investment. And that was really, really good for us to divorce the kind of investor performance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with, hey, we're the largest possible customer in the space. These are the preferences that we want. Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot at stake here. And um, the, the, the CVCs should attempt to be behaving just like a financial VC as much as they can to the point that they should change their aim. Like Telecom Italia, when they had a CVC, called themselves Euro Media Ventures. Smart. You know, you think Telecom Italia is going to be a good brand in London? You know, trying to get into a hot, you know, startup. You know, so that's a good move. But okay, well, I'm going to open up to quite questions in a second. But just to, you, you made a comment that maybe you remember Dave Sabota is a good friend of ours, Georgetown guy, who uh, he's been on the corp dev team at Google for a long time. So he's been buying companies for over 10 years. And in my first book, he gave a quote that said. If like Larry and I decide we want to buy this bright shiny object, and we're excited about you know moving into something at the strategic top level, and we buy the company, the body may reject the organ. You know, so it, exactly what you said. Get an actual you know product manager or somebody you know like the net two phone. You know, we'll take it up to the IT guys and um, and do it. But that's how that happened with us. By the way, I, I knew that company was really small. I did a lot of business with IT. We'll talk about that later. Cool. But let's what are we open it up to questions. And I guess um, we probably need someone to run a mic here. Yeah. 
Hey guys, yeah, um, yeah, thanks for coming all the way to Miami. It's a really uh, great thing to have you down here, great knowledge. Um, so the question that uh, I've always uh, struggled with is what's the right balance between uh, traction and hype? Yeah, because you know, basically, you know, as a startup, you, you don't have a sales force, so you're already hamstrung as far as getting traction, and you know, and that can kill your hype. At the same time, you know, like even Andrew's saying, you know, he wants to see a million dollars before you have to have a conversation with you, so you can show some traction even to corporate or whoever. So how do you? I guess the, the prime example down here is Magic, right? They're, you know, they're going to get an eight billion dollar valuation soon, or maybe without showing anything. So that's one extreme. So, what's what's the uh, right uh, balance? I mean, maybe maybe they, they had shown something. Or maybe they can do it. They've shown something. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, it's, it's so specific. I mean, every case is different. I mean, it really depends on what level of funding and what ground you're raising. Like early on, depending on the type of startup. Like if it's B two B, you might want to see a little bit of sales. If it's consumer, you want to see a little bit of traction. Um, you know, seed levels kind of like on hopes and dreams and promises and projections no doubt, but uh, you're telling a story. Then when you get into the larger institutional rounds, it's really about cold hard, hard numbers and, and, and metrics and scaling that, et cetera. Um, so it really depends on the business and that base that you're in when you decide to raise much capital. And the, the, it, I think what you should sell is context appropriate hype supported by traction. Right? And, Ideally, yeah. And this is what the, the, when you make the decision to raise money, uh, and, and hopefully you have advisors or at least some partners or really angels that can help you with this, really it comes down to narrative. And you have to say, this is what I want my narrative to be six months from now when I go talk to an investor. So I'm gonna spend these three months, four months, five months, building something that's consistent with that narrative. So when you go six months later, you talk to them, you say, hey, this is where I'm going. This is the phase I want. It's like, okay, all right, I don't believe that. If what you do is you're sort of uh, activating in a vacuum for five months, and then you decide, hey, I'm running out of money, and you don't have a sense of what that narrative is, what I'm working towards, what I'm justifying, and honestly, if you do it well, you can get away with anything. You can say, hey, I intentionally decided to do this six months ago, so I was gonna sign this deal, be flat in revenue, because I'm working on this scale this way, and if it sounds like a consistent narrative, people will buy it. So it's not necessarily that you need million ARR or $15,000 contract or anything specific, it's you, you have to be able to sell a consistent narrative. My realization with investors uh, in the investment conversation is that you have to realize almost all investors actually have no idea about your business or industry. Most of them have been out of entrepreneurism or out of the particular industry for long enough that what they are betting on is I'm a good judge of character, I'm a good judge of product, I'm a good judge of team, uh, and if yeah, I, I'm, I can smell bullshit versus reality. So don't depend on, oh, they'll have deep, deep knowledge of my space and they can say this product is competitive, this product isn't competitive. It's, I'm telling you a story and they can say, I believe this story or I don't believe this story. I'd say, uh, you know, rather than say hype, we'll say story. We'll say story versus traction. I think the most important decision an entrepreneur can make is who's your co-founder? You know, like, so me choosing, you know, Joshua and I deciding to do this together, it's like the most important thing about Rubicon. So choosing the right co-founder is probably the most important thing, you know, you'll do. And then recruiting the right advisors, getting Marco to be willing to put his reputation on the line. If you start getting the right people involved that look like the right people attacking the right market, then you can work together to get the narrative down. A lot of times when I hear a startup pitch, I think, I just don't think they've nailed it yet on the pitch. You know, they got to work on that. And sometimes a little bit of a, a shift in how you're describing what you're doing all of a sudden gets people very, very excited. You know, like, oh, this is much bigger than I thought. You know, so I think that that comes, you know, like, you know, I call it you just haven't earned it yet, baby, to get to the point that you've earned it, where like you've got that substantive, you know, pitch down before there's like traction revenue. Um, I think that comes from having sessions with your co-founder and your mentors, and if you choose your mentors or your, theoretically you should put a little money in, but if you get the right advisors around the company early on, you, that, are, that know the market you're going after, then then you start to get there. And another thing I'd say is that, in a world, most startups pivot. You know, most startups pivot. So like in a world of pivots, 
as the investor, I think I'm left with a team in the market they're going after, and hopefully some core you know, technology. So I think the team is just so important. I'm going to get on my high horse for a little bit, because I think your question, uh, at least personally for me, represented uh, a huge evolution in the seriousness with which I took my kind of entrepreneurial uh, growth. And that is basically, there was a period of time where Aiden and I you know, sat in our $200 a month office, and we would look at stories of other companies raising money being acquired. I remember, what's the one that Facebook just shuttered? Parse or something? I remember that have four years ago, something they paid $80 million for Parse. And I, I remember sitting around at this like super, super pretentious table of 22 year olds going, they paid $80 million for Parse, what they do? Like, when I realized I had no idea what the hell I'm talking about. Uh, and so not to defend the magic leap so much as to say, the world is mostly rational. Right, and the people who have given Magic Leap one and a half billion dollars or how much they've given them, Google Ventures, Microsoft, etc. So these are not stupid people. And so it's not hype, it's you have to kind of objectify yourself and say, I don't personally understand what's happening, but let me try and empathize with the actors who are participating in that conversation and say, what are they doing? And what, what you can learn from that is, hey, apparently you can justify $8 billion valuation without ever releasing a product. Now, you, you, that, that might seem crazy to us, but the amount of people who are involved in that are likely not collectively making any billion dollar crazy decision. I want to make sure we leave a lot of time for one on one. We've never been here too. Marco, what, one or two more questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you. Uh, guys, from raising money through the CBC, a lot of what I've read and when I talk to the guys in the CBC spaces, there's a huge problem with retention, the incentives aren't aligned. When you guys got investment through the CDC, did you see a problem with people you were communicating because there was a churn rate? Did that happen to you guys? And did that cause issues later down the ground or are the relationships with the CDCs? I personally never had that issue. I mean, when we closed the round to when we got acquired, you know, it was, I would say, about eight months. So during that time, there was no turnover. That was our case. Uh, I'll say. I'm about two weeks, I think, from our CDC quitting his job. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's the writing on the wall. And I think that everything that you said about incentives, about structure, about how quickly uh, corporates will jump in and jump out uh, is absolutely true. And that's what we learned. So I, I was talking to them uh, before we started. I said, you know, we had two corporate investors. Uh, one was a potential, potential client. You know, they, they were a perfect customer. The other one was basically on our side. They, they were a vendor to the same set of customers. Uh, and if I would have guessed the way that they would have behaved, I would have guessed the exact opposite. You know, I would have said, you know, the client, they have deep, deep incentives. They have deep strategic advantage because this is a product that's worthwhile for them. I, a year and a half ago or two years ago, whenever we were talking to them early on, I said, you know, I can see what the incentive structure is for them to really care and really have strategic advantage. And what actually turned out was the exact opposite. It was, it was, it was one person kind of trying to justify their track record of a corporate ladder, and they were trying to build it around the CDC, and they were able to get some amount of money approved. Uh, and then the company decided to go in a completely direct, different direction. The other one, which I didn't understand, and I'd say I'd give a piece of advice if you're digging in, is trying to find out about the company. Is this led by an individual? Is this led by the board? Is this led by the C-suite? Because on the other side, what it turned out was this was a, a, a committed initiative by the board, by C-suite, and they were moving people around. They were driving this, and so the person who became our representative exists in a larger structure that uh, is supporting it. And that, that was, and so one of them is, it's gonna be okay, but everything that he said is exactly right. We were basically about to get orphaned. Uh, they, didn't, they, they didn't participate in the follow-on round because they just don't care. And there is some cost associated with that because you have to explain to somebody, hey, why isn't the single biggest customer, single biggest client, the investor for your previous round, participating in your follow-on? Um, you can explain, hey, it's because they didn't really know what they're doing and they didn't really care and it's kind of a shitty company from that perspective. Uh, and you can get away with it, but th there is actual cost associated with that. So what immediately seems like this really nice kind of baby of money and, and commercial relationship and advantage has actual kind of long-term decaying costs. Uh, and you know what, actually, I take it back because I just talked to one of the investors that uh, was the corporate PC, and he's actually no longer on this week, actually, very recently. So, <laughs> yep. Well, I mean, just it. one data-driven answer to your question. No, it's just there's happened, yeah. There's 50, 50 VCs that are interviewed in my book, and if you were just to look them up on LinkedIn, <laughs> less than half of them are. So it's more than 50% turnover in like a year and a half. It's more, more than 50%, just those people. But maybe they were to 
really good ones. So yeah. the bad ones are still there. <laughs> but like Andrew said, insulate yourself from that as soon as you can. Yeah, yeah. Know, know it's going in. Uh, I just want to make a couple of comments. One, you know, you just talked about, which is, you know, we're dealing with CDC's uh, primary issue is the charm, right? And that's the whole corporation. But uh, the uh, second issue, uh, that if you have the opportunity, you want to look for a win-win situation. And the win-win situation is that that corporation has a natural vehicle to actually implement the product. Without having to go into sales mode, it's all the business you Okay. And I'll give you an example. Okay. The, uh, 20 years ago, uh, I was in Citi. And the, uh, the, the guy that started as Citi called Venture Capital, the name was Joe uh, Custom. But, but the way he funded uh, in Venture Capital was we were chartered to start an internet bank from scratch. He gave us half of the funding, uh, the Venture Capital. But with one caveat, which is, Whatever internet company I buy, you guys got to use the product. So, you know, we were using the leading edge technology from Lucid, you know, mobile technology, whatever. So, one of the questions I would ask if I were to start up is, do you have a natural vehicle for my product? And do I have to get a sales mode, right, uh, to go and sell to each of the business units? And if you have the option, you know, you obviously you want to try to find something that you don't have to go and sell them, right? That they have a vehicle right inside the corporation where you want to test your product with real customers, right? Thanks, Eduardo. I think, I think the most, it's, you never undervalue the, just getting the cash though. So if people say bad things about them, just, you know, these companies need money. And so getting cash in is good. And you just assess it. Am I ready to align myself with Lucent and shut the door to Cisco and Nortel and others? You know, sometimes it's worth it, you know? I, one of the biggest mistakes in my life was turning down around from Telefonica, BT, and AT&T. And I was in my 20s thinking that that would alienate my ability to do business with everybody else. You know, I think it's like, um, if someone wants to leave the bar with you and you're saying no to her because you're thinking that could inhibit your ability to eventually date every other woman in the bar, that's stupid. <laughs> it, it's the opposite of what's normally said, you're shooting yourself in the face to save your foot. Yeah. It's a little more PC, thanks. Uh, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this whole situation between Google and Uber. And the lawsuit, I mean, Google's a big investor in Uber, right? They have basically this whole lawsuit where Google's self-driving company is now suing Uber. So like, how, how does a situation like that get resolved? I, no, I, I think that that's actual evidence that this Chinese wall that they claim, which I'm always skeptical of, is, is legit. You know, it shows that there's, there's GP, which is you know, the venture group which we co-invest with, and then there's Google Capital, which are just writing huge like Carl Icahn, Fidelity size checks. So, so I, I, it might be Google proper that invested in it. Is it? I so. I mean, I remember... So, magic, it was Google proper, not Google Ventures. When I saw it, and I, know, I use Uber all the time, and I noticed like, uh, it says like, you look up Google Maps, like how long will it take me to get to the lab tonight? And it shows me walking, bus, and then all of a sudden there's Uber there. It's like, oh my God, the valuation is legit. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I think, I think that, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not the right person to answer, but I would say that Google is, makes so much money, they can afford to do the right thing. Whereas other people are forced to provide for their children and like, do the wrong thing. One last question. Yeah, Jeff, you have a space on the map in uh, Latin America and Africa. Yeah. So, you know, from a general investing perspective, but also from a corporate VC perspective, there's a ton of cultural issues around helping startups grow in some of our environments, which makes it very difficult overall for startups um, to continue, you know, finding those partnerships so it's all put on the commercial side. My experience with companies like Telefonica, which I work very closely with, um, and has, have seeked investments from them, is that anything that I did always first had to go from, through the commercial side and it was very far removed from the investing side. Yet, 
you know, you don't have enough traction to get their sales teams interested. So you're just really far away. But it, it really comes down to cultural issues and how they approach you as a startup, how they see opportunity. I just was interested in your thoughts overall, in your experience on culture and investing in some of those other like, cases. So to, to ask that question specifically, what's the difference in culture between an impact investor I mean, or, very, your, your map for Rubicon is there's a lot of white space in Latin America and in Africa. Right. I mean, why? You know, is it a cultural thing? Have you noticed what are the big cultural differences that you've noticed um, that have concentrated so much of your investing activity in the United States and Europe? If, if well, Joshua, you want to answer that question? Because we sent Joshua to Africa. So. <laughs> uh, the map is really a map of where LPs so our LPs are from all over the world, but we don't have LPs yet in Africa, although one just moved there, so I guess we should put them out there, <clears throat> uh, and in Latin America. It's not a question of where we invest. We can invest anywhere in the world. The challenge for a fund like ours and most funds that are financially motivated is what's the exit path of the company that you're investing in, right? We take money from the LPs, we put it to work. We eventually have to get it back because we have to give it back to the people behind us. In Africa and Latin America, especially just in these two ecosystems, there has not been a lot of exit activity for M&A or certainly IPF. They happen but very infrequently in, in the venture capital ecosystem. So that is why you see less and less. In Africa, there's really three ecosystems that matter at the moment, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa, right? And so we look at companies there all the time but there's only certain areas that are dominated, and you don't want to be a VC firm that's uh, you know not a five hundred million dollar fund or something like that, which we are not yet. That's investing large pools of capital in these ecosystems where you don't have a man on the ground or a woman on the ground, you know, watching them. So you got to be careful. Uh, we do see technology go out of all those places. Andrew was actually just in Sao Paulo. Uh, I've looked at stuff personally out of Colombia, out of Peru. Uh, even Venezuela recently too, Argentina, but it's such a diverse ecosystem. Unless you're there every day, living and breathing it, it doesn't matter about your thesis approach. You have to be there. Right? So it's different. Well, I think um, the in, in my book. Hopefully, you get a copy of the book tonight. There's a chapter on MENA, so Middle East, North Africa, and Turkey, and it's almost all corporate. All the billionaires they don't want to invest in the startups but the corporations are doing it. And I think that uh, there's something in it at the government level when you're dealing with some of these countries where um, you say, they all kind of think, oh, if Israel's got a Silicon Valley, how come we can't have one in our, in our province of China or our country anywhere? And I think that um, you know, they, should, they should be thinking about their unborn baby startups that would either be like a copycat, so do a copycat just for that country, and if you have a big enough market like Indonesia or Brazil, that's meaningful. Then they can go for the Israeli model of saying our market's too small. We're going to build fun companies that will go out and conquer the world, like Israelis, rather than be satisfied with the tiny, tiny market. And then they're sometimes solving unique problems. You know, I've been to some countries that are very different from, you know, like they're solving a unique problem, like it's going to be all on mobile or something. Um, but the big thing is that they should worry about their top 50 companies, their biggest corporations, and making sure that they don't suffer from being far away from other tech corridors. And that's where I think it's serious. So I think that corporate, if you read the chapter on MENAP, that region, um, it shows that corporate venture capital is the best hope for these countries almost in a way to, uh, you know, diversify their products and services. If you look at China, and I'll shut up to you, right? If you look at China, it benefited from a low cost labor arbitrage opportunity, plus a government system, you know, and banking and all that. But that, that's going away. If you've been to Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, these places are getting expensive. And so that's moving to India and Vietnam. So they are smart. They're using corporate venture capital as a weapon to diversify their economy into like an Apple computer Goldman Sachs economy. Our leadership in this country thinks that we're going to turn Americans in Ohio into Chinese peasants and build a factory one square meter bigger than the iPhone factory in China. China is making robots that can think like a, like a factory worker with artificial intelligence to stop the factories from moving to other countries. So it's, it's at the country level, this is critical. At the United States, we're fine. We've got a ton of excuses and a ton of entrepreneurs. Great, no, thank you. I want to be respectful of everyone's time.
we wrap it up by eight, so I, we can continue the conversation sort of networking uh, you know, one on one. But uh, before we do, I'd just like to give a big round of applause to Andrew. <laughs>